So I'm coming from the computer science uh, perspective, and I was going to say uh, this was going to be now for something totally different, but I think actually part of my message is going to be very uh, resonant with the message of drawing a picture and kind of <laughs> understanding, you know, what your domain is. And I realized that. You know, this is probably the most sleepy time talk <laughs> slot there is. Um, so I hope that we can uh, make it interactive. Like any good academic, I have way too many slides, but I don't have any compunction to get through all of them. So I don't, um, I don't know you as an audience that well. So as much as you can give me feedback about you know, where you have questions, where I'm being unclear, where something matches with something that you're interested in, that will help to keep us all awake. Um, uh, so, so link mining. Uh, so uh, alternate title for this talk is really, OK, what can machine learning, statistics, data mining, what can it bring to you what kind of toolkits are out there and um, what should you know about them um, so that you uh, uh, know what's easy to do and uh, what's hard to do, what's research, and what you can just get something off the shelf to do. And so obviously in an hour talk, I'm not going to be able to kind of give you all of the details of this, but what I'm going to try and do is give you kind of a sense of the lay of the land so that you know where to potentially go look when you have a problem with your data, when you have certain kinds of issues. For example, the kinds of things that you can do with all of these kind of tools are, first off, make predictions. And so clearly, I mean, in the talks already, there's been some focus on how do I predict things about users, how do I predict um, uh, things about content and so on. Um, also, if your data for some reason has some missing values, which is very common, you can actually use similar kinds of techniques to fill in the missing values and that uh, may make um, uh, better predictions and uh, make your tools and your research more useful. Another important uh, aspect is figuring out what's weird in your data. Now, what's weird in your data could be really interesting because it's a scientific discovery. So, you know, I, I found this anomaly. Or, uh, unfortunately, about 90% of the time, it's really that there's some error in your data. <laughs> and it's really good to look for those errors in the data so that you don't get that the average age of your uh, musician is uh, 150 years old, um, or understand why that makes sense in your data. Then there's other things like finding patterns, identifying clusters that are all kind of useful things that machine learning can do for you. And in general, traditionally in machine learning, they've kind of grouped the top three as things that are go by the name of supervised learning. So the notion that you have some training data that has the correct labels. From that, you're going to learn a model. Then you're going to apply the model to new data and make predictions. That uh, generally goes under the term supervised learning. Um, there's also a whole area that goes under the term unsupervised learning where nobody gives you, there's no teacher. There's nobody telling you the right answer. It's just you kind of exploring the data, trying to find patterns. And interestingly enough, if you go to a machine learning class, an intro machine learning class, it will make a strong distinction between these, saying like either you're in case one or you're in case two. But in machine learning research now, there's a real interest in kind of how do you mix these things? How do you kind of get a few labels, maybe crowdsource labels, and mix that together with your pattern mining thing. And so all of those are very active areas of research. Um, but just to kind of get a sense of where you guys are in terms of your familiarity of machine learning, I saw at least one person nodding when I said supervised machine learning, so that's <laughs> good. So if someone said, what are the top five machine learning algorithms, what would you throw out? Clustering. Clustering. That's a good one. 
Say again? Give sampling. Give sampling is a method for doing inference, but it it very much fits with the prediction. It's a way of making predictions. Yeah. 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 LDA. LDA. So, uh, and which LDA are you talking about? So, LDA. Uh, LDA say again. Okay. Does anybody know the other LDA? Linear discriminant analysis. So we have two models that have the same initials that are very popular in their respective communities. Um, other things? Neural nets. Support vector machines. Yeah, two big ones. Neural nets and support vector machines. Um, any others? Yeah, near and dear to my heart. I, my uh, thesis is in graphical models um, and so on. So yeah, so th there's tons and tons of examples of different models and, that people use. Uh, probably the big one that we didn't mention that actually is very popular is uh, decision trees. And decision trees have the nice property that they can be very interpretable. But there's a whole class of things. Um, but most of the work in machine learning tends to assume that you have a flat representation coming in. So basically that you have an input vector and then you're trying to predict something on it or, um, or you're trying to cluster these input vectors. So what I mean by link mining is link mining is applying these machine learning methods to settings where you have graphs or networks. And the important thing when you have graphs or networks, you really need to think about what's in your domain. So what are the different kind of entities? Usually there's people in there somewhere, or users and so on. But what are the other kinds of things? What are the messages? What are the documents? What are the... Um, places that people can go, what are the groups that people can belong to, what are the organizations, and so on. All of that is actually part of this picturing your domain and really thinking it through. Then, of course, there's the relationships. So what are those links? Um, of course, friends, followers, and so on. So the fact that your data is this giant heterogeneous mess of different kinds of entities and different kinds of relationships. And, you know, in computer science we would call this, or one thing you could call is a data model. So thinking of what the data model is for the area that you're doing research in, I think can be a great benefit to building better models and um, understanding the kinds of questions you can ask and so on. And so here's a little example, it's just a fragment of in social media, you know, what are the kinds of relationships that you can have? Well, there's all kinds of user-user relationships that you could model. Uh, some of them are directed, some of them are undirected, some of them are kind of constructed. So this notion of things like uh, co-edits and co-mentions, two people that have mentioned the same thing, two people that have edited the same document, even though you wouldn't necessarily have that initially in your data, it may be something really useful to construct because those kinds of things can lead to very predictive models. Um, and then, of course, you can have relationships between user documents and they don't have, to, even though we like to draw them as binary because it's easier in our graphs, oftentimes they're triples, uh, so a user, a query, and a URL, a user, a tag, and a document. So you shouldn't restrict yourself to having to have just uh, binary relationships, things between uh, two entities. So I encourage you in your domain, try and kind of build a model a picture like this, um, and that uh, may help you. So I'm going to talk about a couple uh, link mining tasks 
and algorithms, but first I want to kind of review a collection of them. And the simplest one I'm going to call node labeling. And node labeling is the notion that you have some entity, you're trying to predict some um, uh, label for it. So in this example, I have Harry, and what I'm trying to predict for Harry is his political persuasion. Um, and so I want to kind of go through and think about like what are all the kinds of features, what are all the kinds of information that you could get from social media that could help you make this kind of prediction. Um, so what do you guys think? What would you, what would you look at? You know, the political persuasion of his friends. Yes, that's a, definitely a, a big one. So looking at political persuasion of friends, and we're going to see over and over this what you guys, I'm sure, are familiar with this homophily kind of principle, and how do you encode homophily in a, in different ways in these kinds of models? That's it. Yeah. The text or the content that that person posts. Exactly. Yeah. So. Pages they like. Say again. Pages they like. Yes. And yes. Those pages are also similar to what their friends like. Exactly, definitely. Um, and if those pages have with them a label of whether what uh, political party they're associated with uh, and so on, yeah. Mm -hmm. Other? What music he listens to? And does and his favorite band vilify him or not? <laughs> <laughs> And so all of these things, what I want to kind of give you is the tools to think about. I don't have to make a model that necessarily assumes it's just one of these things. I can build models that kind of can stick all of these in and then see which one ends up being most predictive. So maybe the music groups is the most predictive. And um, I don't even have to worry about going and crawling to get the friends and so on and being able to kind of explore those things and trade off and see which one's going to be most useful and which one's easiest for me to get the data for. Um, so things like their friends, uh, TV shows they watch, uh, people they uh, don't like. Um, and then this helps me kind of use the network context to predict an attribute. But now I can do something where I actually can then, once I predict an attribute for Harry, that may give me the information that helps me then predict an attribute for another person in the network. So there's this ability to kind of cascade where I make a prediction for one and then that helps me infer a prediction for another one. And I'm going to talk about methods for doing that. Um, so node labeling is definitely a big one. And you can think of sentiment. Sentiment is also in this vein. So you're trying to label the sentiment of a document um, in a document collection and so on. The other, or another one, is let's change things a little bit and say, well, we're trying to predict whether or not these guys are friends. And of course, you could use this as a recommendation. So recommending who you should become friends with because the algorithm is saying, well, you should uh, uh, like this person. Um, so what kinds of features would you guys use here? So here the distinction is you now have two entities and you're trying to predict something about those two entities together. <coughs> network structure. And what kinds of things about network structure? Um, you would look for holes. So for example, if there is a nearly complete click that is missing on number two, you might suggest those. Yeah, so all kinds of things that look at the net local network structure between those two nodes um, can be predictive. Other things? Common attributes. 
Yeah, so looking at matching attributes. So for example, um, you know, are they of the same political persuasion can be something that uh, predicts whether or not there should be a link. Um, other things? Yeah, so uh, definitely things like preferential attachment take into account um, the uh, centrality of the nodes. So, um, and it's interesting, in some domains, two central nodes may be more likely to be linked, but in other domains, um, like the one that I'm thinking of is a web page classification. Uh, web pages, professor web pages, they'll point to student web pages, but they never point to other professor web pages. Mm -hmm. So, you know, taking into account, depending on your domain, the structure can fit in in different ways. So, it could be that they're members of the same group, it could be that they went to the same school, it could be that they have lots of friends in common. All of these are things that you should be able to encode in a model that predicts um, whether or not there should be a relationship. Um, then the next one that I want to talk about is one that maybe you guys won't be so familiar with, but I actually think is hugely important. And if anything in this talk, this is the one that I want you to get, remember and think about if it happens in your data because it's really important. And um, it's kind of a funny problem because it's entity resolution, and I'll explain that in a sec, but it goes by a bunch of different names in different areas, which is really funny because entity resolution is about resolving names to entities and figuring out if they're the same, and the fact that they can't even get the same name for it, the concept is really entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the abstract version of the problem is, you know, in the digital world, we have all these different, you know, representations for people. You know, it could be your user IDs on the different social media sites and so on. And in the real world, there are different actual identities. And now I know I'm treading on kind of shaky ground here because the whole notions of identities and having multiple identities and exactly how you model this. But this is a computer science view. Uh, we think there's just one identity. <laughs> Um, but there's a couple variations of the problem. So one is just that, okay, you have all these things and it's a deduplication problem or a clustering problem. So I want to cluster all of the mentions that are referring to the same underlying individual. Um, in other settings, it's more natural and this is the one that I'm going to talk about an algorithm for how to do this. Um, uh, in other problems, it's more that you have two databases, and you know that there aren't any duplicates within the database, so all you have to do is do the matching problem across the database. And those end up turning into a slightly different algorithms, um, so it's good to kind of think, which setting are you in? Are you in a setting where you're clustering? mentions, or are you in a setting where you're matching mentions? And then another variation of the problem is that you have something like a dictionary that's clean, and that one does tell you the set of real world people out there, and all you have to do is match to that. That makes the problem much easier. This is something that comes up all the time in um, catalogs, products. Um, if you have one clean hierarchy and then you're looking at you know, eBay and trying to match to that, um, that can make the problem easier. So thinking about what setting, but let me try and illustrate how important the problem is. And this is my favorite example. <laughs> Ben's probably seen it 10 times already. But um, this is actually, it's a co-author graph. So the notes are authors and the links are the fact that they co-authored a paper together. And this is actually from the InfoViz uh, challenge in 2004. Uh, they were using it for a data visualization challenge. And the thing that was interesting about this data is that they said that it had been hand cleaned extensively. 
There were not supposed to be any issues in the data. Um, but if you look at the data for a little bit, you start seeing that there actually are a fair number of problems with the data. Um, and if, in fact, if you look at like the before <coughs> entity resolution network and the after one, these are completely different networks. So you think of any of your network analysis methods, any network statistics that you compute on this graph are going to be completely bogus. <coughs> um, you know, the degree centrality, the path lengths, everything's wrong about it. And then on top of it, just in terms of the story it tells, this one kind of looks like a giant spaghetti mess versus this one tells a really clean story. You know, here's this nice, clean co-author clique. And so one thing I really want to emphasize is you should think about your data, whether or not there's a chance that it has this property, that you have duplicate nodes referring to the same real world entity, and take care of that before you do any further network analysis. Um, and then the last kind of task that I'll mention in general, but I won't go into details, is this clustering problem or group detection, community <coughs> detection in networks. That's another whole class of algorithms. And I'm sure between the four that I mentioned, node labeling, link prediction, entity resolution, and group detection, there's lots of other ones. I haven't talked about dynamic networks and so on, so you know, I'm giving you the 30,000 foot view. So any questions at this point? Yeah. I'm curious, what are the underlying data structures that you use when you do this kind of analysis? Uh, do you use graph databases? Do you use more traditional relational databases? So um, I'm going to go into the methods a little bit, okay. but uh, still uh, I'm uh, abstracting so that people use all of the above. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of folks that use relational databases, but then they figure out that maybe they should use a graph database because when you're doing these things where you're doing a lot of following hops, self-joins, yeah. self-joins are not good to do in relational databases. So you should think about the um, features that you're gonna use. I'm gonna talk a lot about the features. If you have a lot of self-joins, that's a signal that you might want to think about using some special data structures for it. Yep. Well, this may be out of order. When you're trying to mix methods, that is, you have a certain number of attributes available for, you, uh, for each node, and you have a linkage structure, instead you could uh, try to do both at once. Uh, do, you, do you flatten the problem in, in Actually, you, you, you totally are getting to actually my next slide, but um, this is the interesting aspect, exactly how to flatten. Um, and I'm going to talk about first uh, the probably the most naive way of flattening and then get into uh, actually a lot of my work is how to interleave all of these things, but I won't get to that, I'm sure. Okay, so. For node labeling and link prediction, I'm going to do uh, these algorithms for these at the same time. They're uh, closely related enough that uh, I don't want to repeat it for each of them. And I'm going to start off with the simplest version, which is a relational classifier, and then I'm going to talk about something called collective classification. So. In this slide, it's a very abstract slide. I'm going to try and go through it slowly. I want to make sure that you understand it, though. Uh, so ask me questions as we go along. It's a, an attempt to, like in one slide, capture this flattening process exactly. Um, so in this, this is kind of an abstract version of a problem where um, I have three different kinds of entities and I have some links between them. And I need to take this and smush it into something that I can feed into a machine learning algorithm. In particular, a machine learning algorithm that takes as input 
vectors are arrays. So what I'm going to focus on is predicting an attribute. First, the node labeling problem. So predicting an attribute of some of the entities. And in particular, I'm going to talk about predicting an attribute of the green nodes. So everybody's following the colors. These five nodes are those five ones in the center. And the pink things at the end with the question marks, those are the things I'm trying to predict. So in my example from before, it might be that I'm trying to predict political persuasion. And I'm going to basically take the network structure and flatten it into a set of local features. And the local features, what I mean there, are just any kind of attribute that's associated with the node itself. So um, for political persuasion, maybe gender, maybe um, income level, things that are associated with the person itself. And that kind of is vanilla machine learning to take in the attributes of the entity. Um, now I'm going to do this thing where I'm going to construct the relational features. And the relational features are the part that use the network structure. And uh, those things can be as simple as um, counting the number of neighbors, um, counting the average value of some attribute that's linked by some neighbor, but I'm going to compute a bunch of these things, and then I'm going to have a flat vector for each of these five entities that I want to predict something about. So, questions here. I know this is very abstract. Um, so this is one version of the problem. Now I can do a similar thing for my link prediction case. So suppose I'm trying to predict links between the green nodes. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the cross product of every green node with every other green node. I'm again going to construct this vector. This vector can again have the local attributes uh, associated with um, each entity. But in addition, it can have uh, what I'll call these matching attributes. So that was discussed earlier when we were talking about potential attribute types. And um, they can be things like how close the attribute values are, whether they're the same. and then um, other kinds of relational features like counting the number of shared neighbors, the number of shared friends, and so on. So I'm going to get out, again, a vector, but now it corresponds to these two things. And that pink box there is predicting whether or not a link exists between them. So once I've done <coughs> that, then I've represented these things as fixed length uh, features. The instances are treated independently of each other, which is probably not correct, but actually still works pretty well, so it's a good thing to start off with. Um, I compute these relational features, and then the cool thing is I can throw any classifier at it. So of the things that we talked about, naivez, uh, neural nets, support vector machines, decision trees. Once I've done this flattening, I just used existing machinery for this. Um, so that's really cool. Um, the art, however, in all of this is the construction of the features. So being the domain expert that knows what are useful features to encode is really important. Um, so while a lot of work in machine learning is very focused on the different exact method, you know, which 
mathematical optimization are you using? In reality, I've seen this over and over again. You look at the two systems and it's, well, one was using this feature and if you give that feature to the other algorithm, it will do just as well. So something to keep in mind. How am I doing on time? Uh, you've got 20, 20 minutes and then time for questions. Okay. Um, so just briefly to say um, two studies two examples of many out there that do this kind of relational classification. One um, is uh, actually predicting ad click-through rate um, on uh, web pages. And this is based off of a paper. I'm not going to go into all the details on it. As, as I was looking through the slide uh, this morning, I was realizing that I actually don't remember some of the details <laughs> about it. So don't probe me too hard on this. <laughs> Um, but hopefully it gives you a sense of the kinds of things that you can do in a web domain where we have an ad here and we're trying to predict the click-through rate. So how many people will click on this ad? How do we estimate this? Well, we're going to kind of view this whole network of how can we draw in information that will help us do a good job at predicting this. And um, the standard way of doing this is using the bid terms for this ad to then um, get to other ads that have the same uh, bid terms. And for example, doing something like averaging their click-through rate, using that as some input to the uh, making this prediction. Um, using the average click-through rate of related things through synonyms and so on, using information about the number of web pages that contain these bid terms, the number of queries that match these things, and you can kind of construct these rich um, information that you can then feed into your algorithm, try and fit a model that will uh, predict this. And this would be probably a regression model, so it would be predicting the number of click-throughs, having done this flattening. Another uh, case study is for doing link prediction, and um, this is predicting friendships. Uh, it's actually joint work with um, Jen Golbeck uh, from several years ago where we were looking at um, uh, pet works. So uh, Jen has done a lot of work in pet social networks. So dogster, catster, and hamsterster, <laughs> or something like that. Uh, I always remember the, the distinguishing the thing that she said about hamsterster was that most of the hamsters were dead. Uh, but anyways, so you can say what you want. These are really human constructed pet works and so on. But what we were looking at is trying to predict whether there would be a friendship link between two pets. And you can do things like do these matching predicates, like say, well, if they're of the same breed, maybe there's more likely to be pets. But then you can do these all these kind of structural features like looking at first off just the count of the number of friends they have, looking at the count and the overlap of their friends. In these networks, they also were members of families, so you could say something about you know, how friendly they were with their families and add that in as a feature. And you could finally kind of, oftentimes what you want to do is look at uh, kind of the proportion overlap, kind of the correlation coefficient or the Jacquard similarity between the links that actually exist in the network versus the links that could exist. So um, uh, that's a common feature. But these relational features feed into a link prediction algorithm <coughs> that works you know, surprisingly well at predicting friendships between pets. Um, so the key idea in this relational classifier work is the construction of these features. And so the features can be attributes of entities, match predicates, attributes of related entities, some sort of structural 
features or based on overlaps and sets. And you can go a long way with just this simple setting. But the next idea that I wanted to get to is collective classifiers. And this is the idea where we're going to extend our relational classifiers by basically being able to propagate information. So I'm going to make a prediction. Once I've made that prediction, that's going to feed into other predictions that I make. Um, and um, let me illustrate through cartoon how this works. So in this setting, I'm trying to denote a case where I'm the labels of the nodes are these three colors up here. So think of it as a document classification problem where I'm trying to figure out the topic of the documents, either pink, purple, or blue. And the way the algorithms work is, first off, you give me something that's fully labeled. And from this, I'm going to learn a model. And then I'm going to apply it to a new unlabeled network. Now. That not a, is not always a realistic setting. There's a lot of work in um, kind of doing this more semi-supervised, but let's, let's keep things simple here and say we have one fully labeled data set. I'm going to learn a model there. I'm going to apply it in a new setting. So when I apply it in a new setting, I have this new network that has no labels. And so I'm going to kind of bootstrap and get some initial labels for this using just the local features, none of the network information um, to get assignments. And so the local features that I would use here would probably be the words in the document. So just the document content, figure out what initial topic labelings I get. And I would go through and say I would get this assignment, choosing the most probable label. Then what I do to actually start propagating information is I'm going to iteratively update the category of each entity, but now I can use the predicted labels of its neighbors to um, make that prediction. So I can go here. Um, again, I might be looking at the categories of my neighbors to make the predictions. and. I iterate until I reach some sort of fixed point where there's no more changes in the labels. And so this kind of algorithm, while simple, is a powerful way of improving the accuracy of a relational classifier um, and making it so that it's not making each decision independently, but is actually more of a joint model. Yet at the same time, it's very tractable to do something like this. So the key idea here is to um, uh, have this ability to propagate things. There's a lot of variation. So here's where the Gibbs sampling comes up. There's a Gibbs sampling approach to doing this. And um, there's a, a lot of work going on in this area. So questions about collective classification? You get the basic idea behind it, right? This propagation. It's happening. Yeah. Why would you choose to use the propagation model versus the collection model? So the the flat model um, is always the baseline that I would try using. So I, because it's simpler, I would start with that. Uh, in the case, though, where you have a lot of, um, where you really have this whole unlabeled area of the network that you want to make predictions on, that's the case where the collective classification is really going to help you. And it's important to realize some domains that's important to use and some domains you can just get away with doing the relational classifier. Okay, so entity resolution. So I want to talk uh, briefly about entity resolution. <coughs> so this is 
the problem of um, mapping these dimensions to real world entities. And the two kind of things to distinguish here are there's an identification problem, which is basically <coughs> figuring out all of the aliases that refer to the same underlying entity. But then there's also an interesting disambiguation problem. The disambiguation problem is the fact that in some cases, I may have exactly the same string. So I have this J. Smith here and this J. Smith here. And in one case, it refers to one entity. And in another case, it refers to another entity. You know, how am I going to figure that out? I need to encode enough context to uh, make this decision. And the kinds of information I can use, this is actually from that little fragment from before, <coughs> where the square nodes denote the two nodes that I'm trying to decide, are they referring to the same entity or not? And then the way that I've drawn this, um, this is based on work with uh, Ben Schneiderman and colleagues on uh, dedupe. Um, I'm taking it out of context of the tool, but um, is to show the shared relational context in the center. So these are the co-authors that are in common. And then on the sides are the co-authors that are not in common between the two, or at least that I, at this point, think are not in common. And so in this, I can see, OK, here's two names. There's one character difference between them. They have some shared co-authors. And in fact, it turns out that they do refer to the same entity. Here's another case where I have two names, one character difference between them, and they have no shared co-authors. So I can quickly kind of see, OK, these probably aren't referring to the same entity. And it turns out, in fact, they're not. But then, actually, the most interesting thing, kind of like the collective classification, is there's also a propagation effect that can happen here, where I can figure out, say, that these two Elmendorf references are the same. And then once I merge those, that gives me additional evidence that helps me merge the Singer references, where the Singer references, you know, maybe those names are so common, I wouldn't merge them without having this additional information. So uh, again, there are algorithms which allow us to um, do this kind of collective entity resolution, propagating information. And the way they work, um, I think I'm going to skip through some of this animation for time, is to basically form, and I'm sorry, of course, I leave on the math slide, but um, mm -hmm. the, um, the idea is simple. I'm going to use these kind of uh, features that I talked about before, these relational features. And I'm going to basically predict a link where that link is predicting whether or not they refer to the same entity. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to measure the, I'm going to do a clustering based on a similarity function I define on these attributes. And I'm going to perform a greedy agglomerative clustering where I trade off the similarity of where my mouse go. Okay. The similarity of the attributes in a cluster, so the set of mentions, and the similarity of the neighborhood or the things that they're connected to, the co-authors that they're connected to. And then I'm going to basically go through and uh, repeatedly merge things that are most similar to get out my um, clusters. So this will solve the entity resolution problem. And um, we have some evaluation data sets that I'm not going to go into the details here, just to say one is a computer science data set, one is a physics data set, and one is a biology data set. So put those in your mind and think about your stereotypes of these things. 
Um, we're going to compare several algorithms and, you know, we're computer scientists and we're talking about algorithms. So, of course, the p point of this slide is to say, well, there's these baseline algorithms and our relational clustering one does the best. And I haven't told you what this measure is, but it's something related to accuracy. Um, so that's cool. <laughs> this is a, your pattern for a computer science machine learning talk. But the question I have for you guys is, forget looking at it as an algorithm comparison. Look at it instead as a column comparison. We're basically going from something that only uses attributes to something that uses the network structure going down the column. In the first case, computer science, yeah, we get a little bump up from using the network structure. Uh, for the physics data set, actually, it, it's a big enough data set that that doesn't look like it's that good, but it does give you a lot more um, example. Versus the physics data, or sorry, the biology data set, that's the one where we're really getting a big benefit from the network structure. So, any theories for why? nature of the names of the authors. So there's definitely something about the nature of the names of the authors. Um, and the number of co-authors in biology. Yeah. Number of co-authors and those, those are the, the kind of two big things. So it turns out that this computer science data set is just not that ambiguous in the first place. And Computer scientists are loners. They publish with like two people, three people. <coughs> I guess. Actually, but in humanities, I had heard that you're, you have to publish alone. Which seems bizarre. Anyways. Um, <laughs> physics, there are mo more co authors. Um, but biology has the two things the number of co authors, the average number of co authors is much more. I think it was like 10 average. Um, but then they made this a challenge data set by focusing on Asian authors and initializing the first name. So by the time you initialize an Asian <laughs> first name, you've really made it that you have to use the network structure to disambiguate. But the point here is understand your domain, understand whether you're more in the first setting where, oh, you can just use local information or you're in the second setting where you really need the network structure or the third <coughs> one where you absolutely have to have it. Um, so let me briefly say something about the flip side. Uh, all this is wonderful if you're trying to do personalization. So I'm trying to know as much as I can about you to give better recommendations for music and search results and so on. But it's also kind of creepy if you uh, think of it from the other side of, well, all these things basically correspond to something that I can predict about you. And one of the ones, entity resolution, is basically identity disclosure. So how easy is it for me to map from your user ID or your anonymous query to the real world person that you <coughs> correspond to. Um, attribute disclosure, um, you know, political persuasion can be a sensitive thing and certainly um, uh, sexual orientation and so on. There have been lots of studies that show these are very easy to infer even if you've hidden your attributes. Um, one uh, piece of work that we did, so you're familiar obviously with the homophily one, that if you know this label for your friends, you can infer it. But even on a site like Facebook, where you can control the privacy of your attributes, it, it at least used to be the case that one of the things you didn't have control over is if you were a member of a group, it was a group owner that could publish who was a member of the group. And so even if you've carefully hidden all your attribute information by the fact that you're a member of a group, if that group is a, is a group that's very homogeneous in a particular sensitive attribute, it's very trivial to infer that. So taking that into account. Um, 
And so there's a variety of mappings from link mining to these uh, kinds of things. So there, in my group, we do a lot of stuff that actually has to do with networks and um, analyzing them more than just these tools. If you want to look at them, um, go to my web page. In particular, I feel like I can't go to an HCIL uh, supported um, symposium without mentioning. We do uh, a little bit of work in visual analytics, usually with a lot of help from people. Um, so I'm very interested in kind of where machine learning meets uh, visual analytics to uh, have confidence in these predictions. Because a lot of times the statistical confidence you have in these things is really low. And so yeah, it can help you rank something, but then present it to the user so they can say, you know, oh, you just totally screwed up on that one. And then feed that back into your algorithm to improve your algorithm. Um, so the conclusion is that link mining algorithms can be uh, very useful in this space, so be aware of them. Um, there's a lot of active work in this space, and despite the fact that sometimes you still see algorithms that really talk about just a single kind of node and a single kind of link, we really need things that support multiple kinds of relationships, multiple kinds of entities, and so on. And um, these kind of collective algorithms are interesting because they can propagate information in useful ways. And there's a lot of pitfalls to be aware of. So the statistical confidence you have and the privacy, but then there's this kind of trade-off with the benefits of improved accuracy of models. And so one needs to be kind of cognizant of these two things going on. So, uh, thanks. <laughs> well, while you're coming up with one, I have one that, you know, you said that you show the results to the domain expert and then they can say, oh, you got that one wrong. But the most common thing that we see when we show data mining results or statistical analysis is the domain expert says, huh, how come you got that result? And it's very unsatisfying to say, well, the statistics did it. So decision tree models give you a handle on it. But the methods that really work and the interfaces I think are most successful, which I'd like to encourage, are ones which enable the explanation of the sensitivity analysis of the variables and which factors led to, most led to a yeah. particular selection. So yeah, which of the methods are amenable to uh, providing the kind of feedback which gives understanding, not just results? So I totally agree with this and I think that to cast dispersion on my um, colleagues that a, a lot of people in machine learning, you know, they want to twiddle with the math and they're not interested in this aspect. But, for example, um, and it's a hard area to get into because you need so many different pieces, but, I, you know, this is selling my own stuff, but this G pair is very much in that this notion of being able to have multiple models, be able to compare the output of the models, be able to see when they agree, when they disagree, and then be able to drill down. And the interesting thing in these collective algorithms is also seeing like cascades of errors and being able to kind of have something that allows you to follow these. Um, in some of the models, there is something that you can interpret as there'll be a weight on the features. Yeah. So you can interpret that. Um, uh, and that has pluses and minuses. I mean, decision trees is interesting case where it's interpretable, but those are not very stable models. So if you change the data even slightly, you get a completely different decision tree. And so this notion of being able to do sensitivity analysis is uh, important. So I guess what I'm saying is that I 
agree with you. I don't think that you can necessarily point to a model and say it's bad and say there's no chance of making it more interpretable, but there needs to be more work in yeah. making these interpretable. Yeah, it's been a, are there other, oh, Seth will go there. This is uh, sideways on what you're asking. Uh, having to do with the privacy issue, your point's very well taken. Can the system be turned on its head? Having done the analysis, having effectively broken the privacy for a database, can you now say, okay, knowing the various learning, machine learning techniques that allow us to break the privacy, can we figure out how much we have to fudge the data, how much noise we have to throw in, so that what we pass along can be passed along safely without anybody figuring out that I'm the guy who keeps texting while he's driving? Yeah, so, <laughs> so, so there, there is a ver variety of approaches to how do you add noise into the data to make it so that it's no longer that I can, for identity disclosure, go to exactly the individual and say, it's one of those guys in this group. The thing that I think uh, nobody has been able to give a good answer that I'm aware of is all of those methods make some very strong assumptions about having a closed world and not being able to go out and get additional information to join in to then update it. So while there's a lot of work that started off just with a single table, K and anonymity and so on, and now there's starting to be work that's in the relational setting or the graph setting, um, this whole notion of well what's realistic in terms of being able to say and they can't go out and buy another database to join against this to fit in that's the place where I think the machine learning work is useful to kind of give you pause and say here's what could happen in terms of really fixing the problem um, it's a lot more murky in terms of like where policy goes and so on so other question? Let's take, well, we'll take these two quickly, yes? Uh, so it seems like a lot of the common work is to find ways to flatten the data so that we can give it to these algorithms that we already have. I, is there much work or do you see a future for work in developing machine learning algorithms that can natively work in a relational environment? Yeah, um, and to be honest, uh, I actually do a lot of work in that space. Um, so the whole graphical models community is about methods that work with the graph, although still there's things that need to be drawn in there to make, allow them to deal with multiple graphs and changing graph structures. So um, uh, there, so um, here I'm trying to give you a approach to, you have off the shelf things, how to approach them. The interesting thing is there's a lot of people that advocate having these big joint models and oftentimes these ones beat it. So it's good to know about these and start with these before going to these. And Gerhardt's last word. So uh, you ended with showing us some trade-offs of saying well, we uh, have better understanding of personalization. Uh, and on the other end, there are privacy violations. So can these trade-offs be resolved, or will they always be with us? And I mean, I have thought of, about a few more. I don't know whether you are familiar with filter bottles. Mm -hmm. No. Well, uh, so we leave that about uh, away. But for example, another thing is uh, to cope with the machine learning techniques to avoid information overload. But then we know from experience that sometimes serendipitous encounters, which run exactly at the other end, turn out to be really the most important elements in our life. Yeah, so do you see sort of, you know, that these 
trade-offs can be resolved or will they always be with us? I, I think it's important to be aware of them and exactly this information overload is a perfect example. So it's like I can learn this classifier that tells me, oh, I always answer email from so and so quickly, although mine would say I don't answer it quickly from anybody. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. um, but then it's going to miss out that I got a new email from some person that I've never heard of that's, you know, offering me some amazing opportunity and so on so this are you trying to predict to the um, common case so you're finding patterns or are you trying to detect anomalies and alert to anomalies uh, somehow I think that that tension is always going to be there but having uh, systems that can allow you to flip back and forth and say, okay, turn my email answer ranker thing on autopilot and let me quickly go through these and then switch it over and say, oh, you know, tell me what's unusual in my email today and kind of go through those and have people be aware of these patterns and potentially be able to inspect them more. So the notion of actually having a ranker that I could go in and look at and I see, well, this, these are all the things it's using. And then I'd have a better understanding of, am I okay with the things that it's gonna miss? You know, in certain cases I might be. So that's some parts of the elephant. Thank you, Lisa. All right.